Darkcast Network. Welcome to the Dark Side of Podcasts. We talk so much about generational trauma. What about generational healing? friends and welcome welcome back this is true crime connections and i am tiffany your host today i am talking with a very dear friend of mine he is the podcast host of the silver linings handbook he is a coach and a formal journalist who worked with the new york times please help me welcome jason blair hello Hello, hello, friend, and thank you for having me on. I'm honored for the opportunity. I love the fact that as somebody who's a listener and a part of your community, that I get a chance to come on, and I appreciate you coming on to talk. Your episode of my podcast earlier in the year, I just thought it was such a, for me, such a powerful message that we don't normally hear about the impact of the trauma or or of trauma on both the victims and perpetrators and the interconnections and how we can love both. And I think that was like meaningful to a lot of my listeners. So thank you. No, absolutely. And I loved being on your podcast. So I'm glad people found value in it because I mean, that's why we do this, right? Yeah. Why most of us do it. I think (laughs) (laughs) the others are there to make money because it's a well-known way to get rich. I hear. (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) we haven't figured it out right (laughs) (laughs) well (laughs) so they say (laughs) well today we're going to talk about how sometimes our traumas can interfere with our connections with other people because i do believe they go hand in hand Yeah. And it's interesting to think about, you know, you and I have talked about this idea that, you know, I've experienced, and I think sort of stepping back, I've experienced trauma in life. And I don't think there's anything terminally unique about experiencing a trauma. You know, when you are going through a trauma or you have, you can feel very, 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 very lonely and unique in your situation. And I think one important thing to remember is that Suffering is universal. It's the one thing every human has in common, whether you're a Native American or you're Black or you're white or you're a woman or you're a man. We have all suffered, and many of us have suffered through traumas. And I think for me, one of the... my assistant likes to joke that that other people see a dumpster fire and I see an opportunity to roast marshmallows. So, um, <laughs> but... I think one of the bright sides for me of trauma is that suffering has allowed me ultimately, after a very long road there, an opportunity to connect with people more deeply and love people more deeply. And so I think a message that I tend to have for people who are going through the rough parts of it or feel like it's never going to end or nothing good will ever come out of it is that there can be a bright side and there can be good that comes out of it. You just, if you want to get there fast, be smarter than I am. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you had to learn at your own pace. And I mean, (laughs) sometimes we don't get the clues right away. (laughs) I feel like that's what my mother used to say all the time. (laughs) Really? Jason's working at his pace, also known as, when is he going to get it? (laughs) (laughs) It seems like you're on your way. So, I mean, it's a start. Better later than never, right? Right, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah, and I, part of what I think originally, or, 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 or what's happened in the last few years for me, I guess I sort of have to take the story back to 
at the beginning. I am unbelievably lucky as a human being. I have two wonderful, amazing parents, an amazing brother. I always tell people I won the lottery. I won the lottery in terms of family. They're both, they're all patient, which you need to be with me. <laughs> they're all very loving. I Seriously, I, I really think the milkman some days dropped me off. <laughs> I'm not exactly like him. But, you know, they're all very patient. They're very loving. Both my parents were from large families, and they were the only ones in their families who made it out of the rural areas and made it to college. Plenty of people in their families did very well, but they had opportunities other people didn't. And my brother and I had opportunities because of that that other people didn't. So it's like, you know, a very idyllic life. And I think, in looking back at that, I really appreciate it. And I don't know how, I have a hard time even fathoming where I would have been if I had been in a different environment. You know, part of me says, you'll never really know. But I, I, you know, one of the things I want to start the story by saying is like how blessed I am and how lucky I feel I am. And I think that Sometimes it comes from your family. Sometimes it comes from your friends. Sometimes it comes from your spouse. It can come from all avenues of your life. If you don't win the lottery in one area, you might win it in another. But, you know, I'm just grateful. I think grateful for a lot of the people that I have in my life. But we we were talking earlier about when I was a young kid, I was sexually molested by an older teenage cousin. And the interesting thing about it and it, it, it is for me, and the, this has been a pattern throughout my entire life. <clears throat> I don't know. You could really run over me with a truck and I'm very, I'm so unlikely to retaliate. I'm like, whatever. And I tell people, it's not like a self-worth thing. It's not that I don't deserve, it's like water off a duck's back, right? Like you have a problem with me, join the long list of people. But I tend to like, if I'm going to re- retaliate, it's usually because someone has hurt someone I love. And like, I can be a little hair triggery there. And I never said anything. And the way my parents tell my story is that this was going on for some time. I never said anything until I walked into the bathroom and saw her molesting my little brother, my two-year-old. And in my entire life from probably, I he's always my protectiveness of him. And I don't know if it comes from that or was just because he was my baby brother, my protectiveness of him. You know, yeah, it's it's been a strong force. But I re- told my parents in my little kid words, where you don't even know that like something, what is happening, what's bad. And I told them, and I was talking to my dad and my mom actually about it a couple of years ago. And I was telling my mom, you guys handled this perfectly. My dad was listening to the conversation. He's like, that's interesting because I think we handled it terribly. We didn't act fast enough. We didn't do X, Y, or Z. And it was so interesting to hear their lens and how they felt this sense of like failure as parents when I, as a kid, felt like the sense of perfection. And it says something about our lenses in these situations. And it also says something about why we should talk about this because I hope that was a comfort to them to hear that, Hey, on the other side of this, like, you know, it was, it was perfect. And my brother agreed. And in that, I think going through that experience and I think for me and for a lot of people, it's inevitably life changing, but I've always believed that a, the way that they handled it and maybe just part of who we are, you know, it, it didn't affect me. And I don't know what to make of this next part, which is really interesting. And that came in that conversation with my parents. I was like, guys, you remember when this cousin of mine, she had grown up, gotten older, had gotten into trouble, right? I was like, I was, I didn't particularly like her. I was kind of scared of her, but I was the one who said we should let her move in with us for a summer when we had moved and I had invited them and begged them to do that. Actually, like that's how unaffected I felt by it. It was really weird. And they were like, yes, that was. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, 
Yeah, it was in retrospect. I'm like, this is insane. I mean, a couple of years ago, I don't know, like 10, 15 years ago, I ran, I ran into her in Washington, D.C. And I was like, how in the world do I not want to rip your head off? <laughs> I don't get it. But I hope she's changed. I hope good things, right? I hope because I view it a lot like I think you do that there's more to that story that I don't know. There's some something, some kind of hurt or suffering or loss. And it may be something that's happening internally inside of her. It may have been something external. But I think we as humans have this tendency to like, it's almost like the Israeli and Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Like who's faulted is like what year you decide to stop in history. And I think intergenerational trauma is a bit like that. Like we're traumatizing each other, passing it on. And if I say that 1985 or 1986 is the year where we start this story, then you're the bad guy. But if we start the story in 1970, then maybe you're the victim, right? And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about giving people grace or forgiveness. And I do think people need to demonstrate that their behaviors are different for you to let them back into your life. But in terms of grace and forgiveness, understanding people are complex and people and life is complicated. <clears throat> but you would think, right, that going through an experience like that would have left me, I think, feeling wounded. And I actually, in a way, and looking back at my life, and I remember thinking about this in high school, like, wow, this experience of going through sexual abuse has made it so much easier for my girlfriends who have gone through sexual abuse to open up to me about the uncles who abuse them, the other people who have abused them. I feel that same way with my clients. It's actually, it's actually shocking to me because I think sometimes in environments where I don't have closer relationships with people, how many people in those groups are experiencing abuse they didn't talk about when I just compare it to environments where I am close with people. And it's like one in three, one in two, one in four in many of those environments. And I feel like that had been just such a blessing and such a gift to have that. And I guess that's one of the things that I, I enjoy talking to people about the fact that there are some bright sides, that there are opportunities in those dumpster fires to make marshmallows, or as my old colleague at the New York Times used to say, make, turn chicken shit into chicken salad. (laughs) (laughs) I need that salad. (laughs) I imagine it's something that probably that concept of how do we bring something, how do we acknowledge and accept and not run from our hurt? And how do we bring something good into the world from it? I think just taking your time, giving yourself that space, and then finding your way to it. And I think for a lot of the people who, because in ways we are all victims of something, a lot of people who are victims of things in the moment, it's really hard to see the good for you that can come out of it, the good for other people that can come out of it. But in that moment where you're sitting there and... Someone is, let's say, for me, pouring their heart out and sharing something that they never would have otherwise shared if they didn't either know about your experience or your experience hadn't changed the way that you interacted with people. But I don't want to say it's all worth it because, good Lord, I wish that there was another way to become that empathetic or that caring or develop those skills. But in that moment, you know your suffering's worth it because you're relieving someone else's suffering just like my parents alleviated mine. And we're passing something down that isn't intergenerational trauma. It's intergenerational healing in a way. And I love that 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 concept. Oh, I love here. that. Generational healing. Yes. That's where it's at. We need to stop passing down yeah. this craziness. Instead, pass down the strength that we have. Yep. Yep. And I think that's one of the, whether you realize it or not, I think that's one of the most powerful things about your message and part of what you're doing is really taking your own healing 
and passing it on to all your listeners and your guests and other people along those lines. It, it's powerful and impactful as you and, and your listeners know. And I danced through life after that. And I ultimately became a reporter. I worked for the Washington Post, Boston Globe, New York Times, fairly young as a reporter. But one of the things when you're a young reporter, wherever you are, you're going to end up on the police beat. That's just going to be a part of it. Disasters, fires, midnights, and weather stories. That's the other thing you're always going to end up doing, weather stories. (laughs) (laughs) Asking people how they feel about the rain. I don't know. What do you think? (laughs) I think it's wet and cold. (laughs) So... I didn't even know how to formulate the questions at that point. After the pandemic began, it was right like in March 2020, as the pandemic was beginning, I had made the decision after years of not regularly being in therapy, I was like, I really need to go back to therapy. We're like in the middle of this crisis. I'm running a business. I've got all these people I love and care about. I need to be strong for them. I need to be strong for me. And not allow my anxiety to run out of control and start making insane decisions in this great unknown, if anybody remembers the great unknown. And so I went back to therapy and about, and it was really like great. It was wonderful to have the support and somebody to sort of like, you know, process everything that was going on. But as things stabilized in the pandemic, we began to sort of like, instead of focusing on the acute crises, um, Looking forward, and you know, th- there's this time where my therapist and I were we were talking about like something related to my reporting, and I can't remember how it came up, but I was telling her the story of one of my first stories was a crime story, and I was in high school. It was like the summer after high school, and I was working for the weekly newspaper. And I can't remember whether it was like four or five. I think was it four or five? It was four or five kids, local kids who were my age, who went to the school right beside my school, the high school beside mine, where my mom was also a teacher at the time. They had seen a movie where a bunch of kids laid under a train and they went out to Manassas, Virginia at the, the train yards and laid under the train, but they didn't know about cattle prods on trains, which are like meant to knock cattle and debris. And they're very low as opposed to the rest of the, the train. And they were destroyed. And I remember the scene, there were like small parts of bodies for probably 50 yards. because it takes a lot to stop a train. And I'm telling her the story. And I think it was something about like my affect, which was not like this in telling the story. I certainly wasn't giggling as I was telling her, but I was giving her the example and I started giving her other examples. Like one, I'm not sure if I gave her this one at this time, but I'm sure I did. But like one time where I was like, I should definitely uh, consider pulling back from police reporting. So sitting in Brooklyn in the middle of the night, And when you're a police reporter during the day, there are always police lines. So you have to stay back and you can't actually talk to the detectives. You have to hide around the corners they're going to come into and try and get to them. But at night, there are no rules. So (laughs) so you're like rolling up on the crime scene, chatting with them. And one time, like, there's this guy who shot his body's in the road in Brooklyn. And the detectives are like laughing and joking, you know, normal gallows humor. And the detective is like, do you want a Pez? And I'm like, sure, I'll take a Pez. And so he takes the Pez dispenser and he like hands it to me. And I look down and I'm taking a Pez over a dead body. I'm like, I had become that desensitized to it that I was like, "Hmm, maybe I should take a break. But that should have been a sign. This is just more evidence that I'm a knucklehead because that should have been a sign. And so I'm telling her these stories and she's like, how many dead bodies have you seen? And I'm like, I do not know. And I started counting in my head because I've seen in uh, plane crashes. I was there in New York for 9-11, you know, all sorts of murders and accidents. One that strikes me, just hits me on my core is interesting. The one that I have the most reoccurring thoughts about is not a murder at all. It's a little girl. It was like, 12, 11 year old girl who was just walking with her book bag outside of her school and a brick fell off the top of the roof and killed her. 
Like that's the reoccurring one. Is very funny? I don't walk by buildings the same way other people do. <laughs> like, I could imagine. That's yep, crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's something about the randomness. I think the fragility of human life and the randomness of death that are that are frightening. Anyway, so my therapist wisely sent me off, and she was like, "You have a project. I want you to come back with a count." And I came back the next week, and I was like, "I stopped counting at 270." And she asked me after I sort of like racked them up for her in in my head, you know, like drownings, plane crashes. I was there 9-11, but also the plane crash that happened in November afterwards that where the plane actually crashed in the middle of a street in Far Rockaway, um, 747. And even that one, it's not the bodies. It was the luggage and the trees like kids, little stuff and things like that. So she asked me how many of those were natural deaths? Oh, and I was like, zero, (laughs) none. Like I didn't see my grandfather die. I didn't see, I, I had never seen until my mother died last year. I'd never seen uh, natural, natural death. So everything was very unnatural. And I think one of the things that I learned in that therapy that was really amazing, and I was lucky, my therapist, really trauma-informed, she had a lot of experience with trauma because she worked with first responders, EMTs, firefighters, police officers. But one of the things that was very interesting, we sort of came to the conclusion that I had without even realizing it. Because through my whole life, I thought, like, I was traumatized by the sexual abuse, but I managed it relatively well, and now I'm fine. But that I had really built these, like, walls that separated people. And I know all of our walls can look very different. My walls, like I've told you, operated a bit like a light switch, where I could emotionally invest and engage, and then I could turn it off in a moment. And like, just go, and you know, like people think of that and they think like, oh, you turn into a serial killer. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just the absence of, <laughs> right? It's not like necessarily darkness. It's just nothing. <laughs> it's just feeling nothing, which is great in a crisis or if you're like a sniper. I mean, these are, these are be very adaptive skills <laughs> in certain moments. But what I found was the way I described it to my therapist, I was like, it's really easy to turn the switch off. It's very hard to turn it back on. And so the metaphor we use is like, you've got to make a decision. Do you want to be a guy with a light switch that can make all your emotions go away and you feel safe because you can control this and you can turn it off? Or do you want to be a guy with a dimmer? You know, it might take a little bit longer. You may not have as much control over it. You may need to go back and forth. And, you know, initially I was like, I, and I'm not kidding. I was like, of course I want to be a guy with a light switch. Who wouldn't? <laughs> like, <laughs> make your emotions. Yeah. <laughs> but actually the metaphor that kind of like pounded through my head was like painkillers. Like if you have a bottle of Percocet after an accident and like the pain is starting to go away, but you like, you're afraid the pain's going to come back. You just grab the Percocet. like. And actually, it was just an itch. <laughs> and now, now you're completely high and or whatever it is that when you have that light switch, how do you know you're not flipping the switch too early or flipping the switch and missing out on an opportunity for joy? Because you don't really like I really am a firm believer of like no light exists without darkness. No joy exists without sadness and pain. So intellectually, I got that part, but she was such a cool therapist because she just said, you have to just make a choice. Do you want to be this person who feels safe and misses out on joy in life? Because that might actually work for you. Or do you want to take the risk and jump out and try and feel? And so after about a year of going back and forth, I was like, I'm going to make the jump to 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 try to feel. And trust me, it wasn't like I decided and then it happened. <laughs> it happened in some fits and starts, man, and some running back to that compartmentalization and that light switch. One of the things that I I think I one of the great big revelations like as an example in this for me 
was eventually I realized in this process that my mom had been ill for like six, seven years. And I realized I had actually, as much as I love her and as much as I meant to her, I had been pulling away from her. In retrospect, you can hear things, I can hear things in my head that my partner, my sister-in-law said about like, you know, your mom's not going to be around, Jay, or other things forever. I think they were picking up on the fact that I was pulling away as she was getting sicker. And I think one of the really cool things about deciding to feel is it allowed me to run toward her for the last year of her life instead of run away um, from her. It was not the easiest thing to do, but oh my God, I'm so glad because I would have missed out on so much if I, if I hadn't done that. And so, you know, I, I can't pretend to say that making that choice in front when faced with your trauma and your coping mechanisms, you've come up to manage it, that it's the right move for everybody or that any time is the right time. Because I'm sure my brain created that light switch for a reason, right? To protect me when I wasn't safe, right? You don't have to feel, you don't have to face things. It's easier. You're yeah. just, you just exist. Yeah. And I think there are probably moments where, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I, I think that there are probably moments where all we can do is exist and like, we need it just like uh, the days where we need like comfort food or we can't go to work or we need a mental health day. Like there are moments where like maybe the pain is so deep and so difficult that you don't, that you don't need it or that you don't, or you can't deal with it. And that is a great tool but the problem with that tool is, like, once you pick it up, how do you put it down? I always think if you keep pushing something off, pushing something off, pushing something off, one day you are just, you're going to lose it. Because there's something's going to happen and all that stuff, all those feelings, all those thoughts that you pushed aside, <laughs> they're coming out whether you want them to or not. <laughs> you can't hide all yeah. that forever. You will get sick. You will literally get sick because your body doesn't know what to do with it. Hmm. Sort of like that idea that we're keeping, almost keeping a secret from ourselves. We're trying to hide it. We're trying, to, we're, anyway, but at the same time, we're allowing a kind of cancer to fester inside of us without like treatment. That's an interesting. Oh, for model. sure. Yeah. And there's the, piece of it where it's like there's a downstream effect of that and i think one of the kind of like bright brightest res revelations in this has been like being able to feel and have those emotions i can tell you that the last two years of my life have been like being a toddler again like <laughs> crying at a dime and but I, it allows me to be more vulnerable again it allows me to like love people more deeply uh, so there are all those there are all those i think positive things about it but when i look back in life during the period where i i actually had tremendous success i rebuilt my life after leaving the new york times in a scandal i all these good things were going on but even I had difficult time connecting with even my mom. I had difficult time connecting with the people who were closest to me. I had a 10 year relationship and with my current best friend because there was no, the most intimate version of a relationship with me was still, even though I didn't realize it, 10 feet away. Because even though I didn't think of it that way, it truly operated in a world with plenty of optimism, but a firm belief that nothing was safe enough to be within this zone, if that makes sense. And I think there's the harmful part for me, right? That loss of opportunity for deep connection. But I also think there's a harmful part for other people because other people, like, you know, they hear our words, right? And I'm not, I, I don't throw I love you around. But whatever it is, I never have really been an I love you thrower. But what they hear, like socially, there's certain acceptable things that you say in 
any interconnection with other people. And they hear these words from me, but they don't have the same meaning for me. They don't have the same depth for me. So I'm these relationships would develop where I would have deep relationships for them with me, but it never had that same depth for me. And so in retrospect, like not only do I have like 10,000 people an apology, but I was fostering and nurturing a connection toward me that I didn't really have for them. And that inevitably led to hurt and disappointment because those words meant something to them that they never made to meant to me. And that's another revelation. Like my lack of tending my trauma with a healthy coping skill has had a great cost for other people. I could totally see that because you weren't emotionally available for them. You had cut that off. And it seems like you probably weren't even there for yourself emotionally. You were just out to lunch. You had that sign up and it never went down. <laughs> Gone fishing. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's, yeah. And I, you know, it ends up being a synergistic effect. But I think one of the, and you probably see this in people too, that we learn like we have social norms and there's certain things we do and there's certain things we say, you buy some a flower, you give them a gift, you do X, Y, or Z, you ask them how their weekend was, right? Like all these social niceties. And, and I'm sure like the weekend one is a great example because I think it's about 50, 50 of us who like actually want to know what your weekend's like. And the other 50% of us are like, don't care. (laughs) Just totally being socially nice. (laughs) (laughs) I think, oh, wait, no, you know what my favorite is when someone goes, hey, how you doing? But they keep, they walking. keep walking. So you're <laughs> they're looking back at you. Walk. Right. <laughs> right. I How's your day? I literally had that happen in the hallway today where he was walking by. She's like, how are you doing? And she's be- through the doors before she stops waving <laughs> to get a word out. But yeah, so those things are like harmless versions of them. But we have all sorts of similar social things that we do, I think, in close relationships, close friendships that carry deep meaning. And here's what I felt like. Here's what I felt like. I was, it was a mimicry that I was modeling and singing the song of a human. And it would convince people that I was a human and that I was actually connected to them. But it was really just me replicating the social norms around me. So so inside, were you like, I am a robot? (laughs) What would it felt like? (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And actually, you know, people would be calm. They'd be like, we're in the middle of a crisis. Why are you so calm? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I am robot Jason. <laughs> I think it it felt. I, I think at times it felt like that, but I I think at times it's very funny because I think at times it just felt like oh that's what I'm supposed to say because that's what that person needs to hear to feel better. So I'm going to say this right now, and it felt like you know what it felt like. It felt like a math equation. All right, person feels. Uh, seven and we need to get them to 10 so we need three and if i put one plus two together that equals three and if i give it to them then they're a 10 and we're good (laughs) and that's why i hate math (laughs) (laughs) don't worry i'm not even sure if any of that math added up (laughs) letters and numbers don't go together (laughs) and either feelings Oh, that's so funny. It's so true. It's so true. I think if I had a message back to the people, I think certainly people, there are a lot of people who feel like they've never gone through something traumatic. And I I suspect there are some people on this planet. So probably all one years old now. Birth is probably traumatic. But (laughs) I'm sure there are people somewhere out there. But I think we should all search our soul for our suffering and spend some time thinking about how it affects 
our lives. And I just think I'm so lucky to have that therapist who got me focused on what was it subtracting from my own life and joy, like this joy thing, like as I began to unravel and I realized I had concluded, well, joy is just not worth it. And I will tell you, I've been a bumbling mess for the last two years, emotionally a bumbling mess. It's been so awesome. It has been (laughs) unbelievably awesome. I don't know. I mean, look, I, I felt an amount and a measure of love for other people and have been able to accept other people's love in a way that I'm just baffled. I would pay any price for this, right? I was talking to somebody today, helping out this friend of a friend who has cancer. And I, so like I'm providing some financial support, doing some other things, some emotional support. And I was talking to another friend who's not a part of that circle about it today. And I was like, if I could go in and take her cancer away from her and take it myself and have it, I would. And my friend said to me, I totally believe you, actually. I believe you would. And like being able to feel that kind of love for people and being able to give that kind of love to people, I... For me, the emotional safety of being able to flip that switch off is not worth the joy and sense of connection that comes from that. It's not worth... I I don't think I would have ever found peace in the grief of my mom's passing. I don't think I would have been able to look at it and even understand. I think I would have felt the grief, but I would have had no idea what it was. And because I've come to the conclusion that my grief has really just been love that has nowhere to go. And to me, I think being able to take that love, being able to take that legacy, the things that my mom did and grab her love and pass it along to other people, I don't think any of that would be happening if I hadn't opened myself up to this. So you probably never would have spent that time with her. Yep. And it just would have been another day that something happened, but it's so powerful. And I'm so happy that you did choose to actually do the work because if not, just think of how much more you could have missed out on. Yeah. And I see it like being sober. It is a daily struggle. Some days are easy. Some days are hard, like any habit. You're trying to break, break, but so far, and I can't say, I'd be lying to you if I told you that last year has not been filled with other elements of grief, but even in those moments where I felt deeply sad about things, there's also this sense of appreciation that I feel in those moments of sadness. Appreciation, just like anything you lose, right? You can lose your favorite toy and cry about your favorite toy, as you should, because it was your favorite toy. And you can also appreciate your time with it, too. And I think if I didn't cry, because I could flip the switch and not cry, I'd also probably not appreciate in the same way. Right. It would mean it didn't mean anything to you. Well, clearly it did. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. And I, I don't know, man, like it's it's funny too because I think some of it's gendered, some of it's not, but I think some of it's also race can play a role in it. But I, I think we're whatever it is, right? Like we're not we as humans are not wired to think of ourselves as victims of things. And I think very often that mentality leads to us us to become victims of ourselves and our self-delusion. And I think just being able to sort of like search your life and identify your suffering and seeing how it impacts you and how it impacts other people and seeing how you can find good out of it. It's just been a life lesson. If you go back to the being sexually molested and then being able to help out my friends then and going through this kind of trauma and in the last year being able to love people more deeply. None of that happens if I don't open myself up and if I'm not willing to be vulnerable. My podcast wouldn't exist. 
I don't think if I had made that decision. Or it would exist in some much more annoying form, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that. N- not the annoying part. <laughs> but would it exist? Yeah. I don't- because you're trying to help people. Yeah. I mean, would you be wanting to help people? Oh. Possibly. I think I would have been wanting to help people, but it would have been like your Tesla wants to drive. <laughs> be like a robot doing it. And I think the, the, the big difference there is you're going through, going back to that math, you're going through the mathematical formula of helping people like the script and you're not going through it. It becomes very objective and it eliminates the subjective things like the art of it, the vulnerability, the, the spiritual part of it, all these things that come to bear that logic cannot solve or figure out. So, <clears throat> yeah, it would have been a boring podcast. It would have been like a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> you would have been on there. Johnny number five. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It would have been the opposite of your podcast for sure. Like, <laughs> let's talk about our feels. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, and uh, and this is going to come back to your podcast. I think that's really been one of the blessings. Like, you know this, but your listeners don't know. Like, I'm messaging you about guests. You're like, I've had her on twice. And then I'm like grabbing and going and listening to those episodes. I've gone through your backlog and, and every episode learned something beautiful and relatable. Even when I'm like looking at the description of the episode and I'm like, well, that has nothing to do with me, but I may want to know something about that. I'm like halfway through, I'm like, oh yeah, man, that, <laughs> that does have to do with me. <laughs> oh, but I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the power of like, when you allow people to really tell their stories, things become relatable in ways that they wouldn't like. And I think there are all sorts of social ills I think that could be, addressed by if we just had the opportunity which comes back to my podcast i think <clears throat> to be able to talk to people intimately and listen to them and hear them like i think we have a tendency to focus on that narrow sliver of what's different about us and people are way more alike than they are different we have way more in common than we and that, and going back to the episode with you, people who are perpetrators of things or who do bad acts, whether it's a mistake or not, we often look at them as so unbelievably different than us. But in reality, like the amount that's different than us is like this or nothing. And it gives us an opportunity to love them more deeply, to love ourselves more deeply, to be honest with ourselves about who we are. And that one is a, is a tough one because when you're watching that, I don't know, pick that murder trial and you're demonizing the, the accused or the, the convicted, are you really looking at them realistically if you can't see the parts of them that are like you? Like maybe you'll never commit a murder. Maybe this has nothing to do with murder, but like that person loved their kids like you do. That person did X, Y, or Z like you do. And I think that there's, something about accepting that that allows us to connect. I hate to say that sound like a James Taylor song, but like, I think there's just like a real opportunity to shower people with love. If we accept that we're more alike than we are different. Absolutely. They're all people. And so many of the serial killers, I mean, obviously you have a choice to make when you've been, molested neglected abused you have choices you can live in that trauma for the rest of your life you could fix yourself or you could become a victor yourself and victimize people unfortunately sometimes people don't know where that cross comes to Mm. and so they keep pushing and pushing and pushing and now you are way too far Mm. But I don't think any of them really expect to go that far. It always yeah. starts off with fantasy. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think Jan- Johnny is generally walking down the street thinking, 
as a four-year-old, like when I'm an 18-year-old, I want to carjack someone and kill them. Or I don't think to your point about like serial killers, and there may be exceptions, right? Because we don't know everyone's history. But even if you look at somebody like Ed Kemper or some of the most notorious serial killers, um, I, I don't, it didn't, it doesn't, it tends not to start out with wanting to do harm. But to your point, it starts out with wanting to fulfill fantasy. And the thing about a fantasy is the more, quote unquote, societally deviant your fantasy is, the more you have to hide it, the more, to your point from before, the more it builds up and it builds up and it twists and becomes bigger. And then all of a sudden, you have this giant ball of harm that is the only way that you can feel fulfilled. And, right. and I think, by the way, that's relatable to everyone because if you walked into an AA meeting down the street, they would say you're only as sick as your secrets and you need to process this stuff. That's like that part of it, maybe not the serial killing part, but that part of what's going on internally, 100% relatable. If you're honest with me. You're only as sick as your secrets. Oh, why do I love that so mm-hmm. much? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think it's fundamental. And and those are also the secrets you hide from yourself. But I think it's fundamental in just taking it back to the alcoholics idea is that obviously things are not going well when you're an alcoholic and you're drinking. But actually the real sign that things are going off the rails usually comes before you start drinking and you start keeping secrets and you start lying and they become poison. because. What does that poison of a secret become? It becomes shame. It drives really fast past guilt and straight into shame. And what does shame cause you want to do? Uh, make poor decisions. <laughs> right? Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It all builds on each other. And it cuts you off from your support, too. That's the other thing about secrets. Just like you were talking about serial killers or we're talking about alcoholics. Having secrets cut you off from the people that you um, that support. I have a client who's doing really well, this relatively young client. I mean, he's been doing exceptionally well. I've been working with him on and off for years. He's come back from college, like first three months of beautiful stability. And he said to me today that he had, for the first time in like six months, he had had a, he had anxiety and an urge to have a drink and he bought alcohol and he had a drink but he's like and his mom and his brother are important parts for the sobriety and he's like i'm not gonna tell him because i'm not gonna tell my mom because she's having a, a procedure coming up and i don't want her to worry and i genuinely believe that that's what his reason was and i was like okay you keep that secret for three days let's see how that works right you not only will you be carrying a secret that you think about every time that you talk to her, you'll be cutting off your support. And if you go and you tell her right now that it just happened yesterday, that's going to be a sign of improvement to her. I don't think it's going to cause her to worry. And I really do believe that like eliminating secrets does not mean sharing everything with everyone in the world about you, right? We all have different, different masks that are legit and perfectly fine. But always having someone that you can share the things that you're struggling with or that are ailing you or that you're wondering about or that scramble things in your brain, I think it's just an important part of always staying healthy. Yeah, you're allowed to let your mind wander and to think about some weird shit. Just don't live there and don't act on it. Right, right. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, and I think... To that point, don't let it be a source of shame, right? Right. And I think, yeah, <laughs> there's no turning back once, you, then it's lie, right. lie, lie, right. lie. Right. Yes, yes, yeah. That's funny. Like, I've been, I've spent a, a lifetime of watching people, like, I guess as a reporter, you're constantly paying attention to this. We all see it, but like building themselves up and then, falling off of pedestals. There are a couple common things. I see those challenges of uh, shame and hiding things. 
And in that combination of like shame hitting pride and that unwillingness to admit that you need to, you need help and you need to be vulnerable. This is why probably I cry as many tears on my podcast as my guests do. Cause <clears throat> I'm trying to, in every one of those interactions, open my whole heart up to what's in front of me because I think I've realized over time that the pride's not going to get me anywhere, like looking strong or looking tough or being, and the people who are attracted to that and who need that all the time are not going to be the people who are going to be able to love me in any deep, authentic way. So anyway. Yeah, they're not your people. No. <laughs> you are my people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're going to have you back on some point soon. Yeah. We're going to two times a week in November, so look out. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> yeah, good you for you. Yeah, it's going to be crazy town. I think what really happened to me was like, I was like, look, I keep on coming up with all these ideas for guests. My Listeners are now coming up with all these ideas for guests, and I want to talk to them all. And I want to talk to them all tomorrow. And I was like, "Wow, <laughs> my life is not long enough <laughs> to get to all these guests." And then the solution was like simple: wait, hold on, I can double up. <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be exciting. It's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be fun, and hopefully, we'll get a chance to have you back on sometime soon. I would love that. Cool. I'll make sure I put a link to your podcast in the show notes so people can check out your podcast because it is very uplifting and amazing. Thank you. Just like yours, my friend, just like yours. So, Is there anything you wanted to leave the listeners with? Love yourselves enough to take a risk. Mm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if you know anyone who could use this episode, please share it with them. We need to share the wealth of knowledge that we all put together in this world. Our experiences equal knowledge. And sometimes we can save people from such heartache in the future from helping them where they are now. So please, anyone listening, if you're like, oh my gosh, Timmy needs to hear this, send it to Timmy. Timmy! <laughs> send it all right well thank you so much for being on jason i really enjoyed this You'll be good my friend i will see you soon i'm sure oh i'm sure too <laughs> <laughs>